Let's pray here. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today because you are the Father and Creator and Ruler over all things and over all people, over all time. Lord, we live in your world, and I pray that as we spend this time together this morning that, that we could honor you individually and honor you as a, as a people, as your people. So, Lord, help us today with your presence, with your spirit, with your word, with Jesus Christ who lives within us. Help us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do you pray? Why would you ever pray? What good reason? Maybe what bad reason? Maybe there's no bad reason to pray. But what makes you go to the Lord in prayer? Paul begins this section of Ephesians with the words, For this reason I pray. For this reason I kneel. For this reason I bow down. I prostrate myself before the Lord. I I put myself in His presence in a humble way. For this reason I pray. What's he talking about? He's probably talking about what he's mentioned in Ephesians 1 and 2, where there is a whole long list of great things that God has done for us already. You were appointed to be God's ambassador of Jesus Christ by the will of God. God blessed you in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing that is in Christ Jesus. God adopted you as his son. God adopted you as his daughter. God loves you. He has taken you into his family. You have redemption through Jesus' sacrifice. There's a a long list of reasons that God has already done, already accomplished, already finished that should bring you to God in prayer. And then there are other things that Paul mentions in Ephesians 1 about things that are not done yet. Things like, may God bless you with an open-eyed heart so that you may see God better. May God bless you so that you know the hope to which he has called you and the glorious riches to which he has stored up in heaven, not just stored up in heaven, but he's blessing you with today. There are plenty of reasons that Paul says, for this reason, I pray for you. Because our God is a God who has done so much for you and is still working. God was at work in Paul's life God was at work in the the people of the church of Ephesus. And God is still at work in the church at York. And God is still at work in you. In you and you, everyone here. So let me ask you, what reason do you have to pray? What are some of the things that God has already done, already finished, already accomplished in your life? And you look back and you say, man, only God could have done that. With what I knew at the time and with whatever, only God could have brought me through that or brought our family through that or only God could have done that. Or what are some of the things that are still left undone in your life? maybe spiritually or in some other way, what are some of those things that you count on God for? What are the reasons that take you to prayer? Let me ask, what is that one thing in your life that if God would just do that, if God could just do that, if that would work out in God's way, what is it? What is that issue for you that would change everything? Part of that would be, what is your responsibility in that? And that is not as a shame or guilt or to to put you under any condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what is your responsibility in that? And as you're thinking about that, it's, it's not all up to you. Think about what you know about God. What is is one aspect of the character of God 
that as you think about that situation, it's something at work or family or neighbor or financial or physical or spiritual, whatever that issue is, what is one aspect or two or three aspects, character aspects of God, that you really need to count on in order for that to be resolved a little bit more in your life? So what reasons do you have? Things done, things yet undone. But you can count on God. You can count on Him. Paul says that he kneels. Now, the way your body is positioned in prayer, you can pray sitting in a chair like this. You could pray kneeling. You could pray flat out on the floor. You could pray standing up with your arms raised. That is not as important as the posture of your heart and the attitude of your heart. But Paul does say he he gets down on his knees. He kneels in prayer to show his humility before God. The typical way to pray in that day for a Jewish man would be to stand like this, counting on God, depending on, looking for, searching for God and answers. But Paul gets down on his knees. When you pray, do you pray in different physical positions? Again, the attitude of your heart is important, but sometimes the physical position that you're in can help direct your mind and remind you if you're flat out on the floor, it's hard to be proud well, I, people can still be proud however they, they go before the Lord, but, but it's a little bit easier to remember why you're laying on the floor like that. And Paul says the way he uses this word kneel is he's indicating that he's praying continuously. I pray for you. He talks about the Ephesians. It's a continuous, ferocious, fervent, open, honest Humble prayer before the Lord when he goes there. And when he prays, he is praying to the one who's over everything. And I would hope that you, when you see God, that you see God as the one who is over everything. He uses these phrases. He goes before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. He prays that out of God's glorious riches, that God would answer the prayers. Notice just one thing here. How big is this God? that Paul's praying to. What kind of a God could be the Father over everyone? What kind of a God has glorious riches? A God who's over everyone and a God who has glorious riches. That's the kind of God that Paul is counting on. Not a God who's there part-time or a God, but, but a strong, strong God, as we just sang. God is a strong God a fortress for all of us, a helper for you in all times. Will your need ever be bigger than God's capacity to help? Will the issue, will your problem, will your life ever get to a place where you are beyond his resources, his wisdom, his mercy? Will he? Yes or no? No. The issue you're dealing with today, is that beyond God's help? No. Not at all. So pray. And pray for God's strength, the Holy Spirit's strength in your heart. I want to share with you a secret about about being a better Christian. And I promise you that this secret will change your life. If you do this thing over and over and over, every time you're presented with a challenge or temptation or any kind of crisis or not even a crisis but just a moment if you do this you will fail every time did you hear that somebody coughed if you do this every time you will fail every time that secret is if you want to be a better christian try harder Try harder out of your own guts, out of your own commitment, out of your own strength, your resolve. I can do this. I wasn't able to do it the last 52 times it happened, but, but this time it's going to be different. I'm just going to be a better Christian. No. Paul says the change that has to happen in you 
is that you need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in the inner part of you. And that as you trust God more and rely on God more and, and you're more confident and free with, him, with God, that will make the difference in your life. That's a difficult thing to do. Because there are parts of the inner, and let me just talk about myself, there are parts of the inner self that are reluctant to be open to God. Let me say it this way. If you were to come over to my house this afternoon, our house this afternoon, you'd be welcome to come to the front door. Don't think about coming through the garage because it's a mess, okay? You'd be welcome to come in the front door, walk right through the hallway, past the closed doors of the coat closet, past the living room. You can admire the beautiful kitchen, I put, or the floor that Bob and I put in a couple years ago, but then we're going to go right through the family room and out on the back porch, and we're going to spend a couple hours out there having hot dogs because it's nice out in the back. But there are some rooms that really are not ready for visitors. There are some doors that will remain shut for as long as you are in the house. There are some drawers in the kitchen, evenly. We have one drawer that has one of everything that could fit inside that drawer. You may have one of those in your house. There are places that are shut off to visitors. Are there places in your life that are shut off to God? Those are the places that need to be opened up. Those are the places where God, well, you need to give God permission. Go ahead and open that door. We'll clean out that room together. The Holy Spirit will let him in there and will let him work. That's letting God work in the inner self, the inner part of you. so that Christ may dwell in your heart. Paul says this, that this is one of the reasons that he prays that the Holy Spirit would fill the people, so that Christ will dwell in your heart. Not just come in the front door, walk through the kitchen and out the back door, so that he may take up residence there, so that he may be the Lord, not a servant, but a permanent part and the most important part of your life and your heart. Paul also says a result of this prayer will be so that you know the love of God that is so great that it cannot be known. Listen to this again, what he says in verses 18 and 19. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep. He's, it's like a three-dimensional image he gives there. How deep is the love of Christ? And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. To him, to Paul, God's love surpasses knowledge. To, he wants them to know the love that surpasses knowledge. Well, that, that's kind of a contradiction, do you hear that? To know something that cannot be known, that's so big it cannot be known? Well, how can you know something that cannot be known? What is Paul saying about God's love? He says God's love is a continual stream that never ends. When I was a kid, some years ago, we would get our water from a spring that was by the side of the road, and there was this pipe that came out of the side of the hill, and the water just came out. I don't know. Did, you, did anybody ever get water that way from somewhere? Okay, all right. Every time we would go there, the spring would be going. You just put your gallon in and put another gallon in, and it would fill it up. Well, we went by there. I went by there, happened to be on that road, went by there, and that water was still coming out of the hill. 50 years later. Amazing how I could remember that from the time before I was born. Okay, all right. Anyway, 
That would come out. I could have been sitting there by that spring for 50 years and drinking that every day, all day long, all night long, and I would have had enough water, plenty of water, and there would be more and more and more than I would ever need. When you go to God's love, there is more and more and more and more than you would ever need. And you could just sit there all day long in God's presence and the love of God just flows and flows and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And and I could just keep going. God's love is like that towards you. Sometimes, going back to that house image, you need to break down that door that you're holding closed against so that his love can fill every part of your life, every part of your being. So that you will be filled with all of God, he ends here. Open up the inner parts of yourself to God. As you sing and listen and meditate and maybe confess sin and evaluate where you are with the Lord through the rest of the service, I hope, I ask, I pray that you would let all those things go that have kept you from God. Confess your sins, receive God's mercy. Let him raise you up on eagle's wings and hold you in the palm of your hand. Amen.